Hey everybody, uh, welcome. My name is Dan Bowen and I'm a balloon science consultant and expert uh, and have been doing balloon science for about 15 years. And uh, we're here today uh, to field questions uh, from you guys about the technology and the science of that balloon that overflew the US as well as stratospheric balloons, uh, long duration, short duration, Project Loon, which I used to work for for several years, and the general balloon technology. So feel free to ask any questions or say hi, and uh, we'll see what we can do. So let's see, we have a, a comment. I'm hyped for this. Maybe you could spend some time talking about the terminology being used in the media right now. Surveillance, weather, balloon, airship. What do the terms mean and why are they used? Great question. Is a weather balloon a surveillance balloon? What's the difference between a balloon and an airship? Fantastic questions. So um, let's talk about weather balloon and airship. Weather balloon is just simply a colloquial term used for balloons that fly high in the atmosphere these days. Uh, originally, uh, it applied only to balloons that collected atmospheric data, like wind direction, temperature, and humidity, to actually give you data on the weather and help forecast the weather. While these types of balloons still fly, uh, about a thousand every day around the planet, to gather weather data, the general whole field of sending balloons up very high has now become just known as weather balloons. So this balloon that flew over the country uh, in the past week uh, is not technically, is probably not technically a weather balloon. Uh, weather balloons are typically just a large latex balloon that flies straight up in the air, bursts, and then falls back down. But to lay people, weather balloon is the closest thing uh, that most people have heard uh, of this sort of a uh, and a, de a device. So airship is airship is a airship is a device. It's, it's an aircraft that is lifted by helium or hydrogen. It's a lighter than air vehicle uh, that not only can float at a constant altitude, but it has a propulsion system and it's streamlined uh, to actually allow it to go forward through the air um, in an efficient manner. Things like the Goodyear Blimp. Uh, the old Zeppelins uh, and the modern proposals for cargo airships uh, all fall under this category where you have some sort of propulsion to move forward uh, through the air. The difference between a balloon and an airship is that propulsion. While the shape of an airship might not always be cigar shaped, um, it is still lighter than air. Um, you might have a propeller or something on a balloon but it's kind of debatable as to whether that's an airship because uh, it's kind of hard to actually drag and move a balloon with propulsion due to the fact that um, a sphere is very high drag. And what that means is you're gonna spend a lot of power just plowing air out of the way, or if the propeller is on a long string, a pendulum, it's gonna be pushing the string out ahead of the balloon and the balloon is basically going to be like a, a big anchor that it's being dragged behind that. So this particular balloon uh, that we've seen flying over uh, would be definitely classed as a balloon um, from what we can tell. It doesn't appear to have propellers or propulsion, though a prior generation of this uh, did seem to have propellers in the southwest Pacific and in Asia, where it was sighted over, I think, the... Uh, Philippines and Japan. Uh, I can bring up pictures of that here in a minute. Um, so China has actually been flying this particular type of balloon for uh, at least three years uh, that we have seen uh, in you know UFO sightings and such. Uh, let's see here, I'll bring up some pictures from my Twitter of this several years ago when I first noticed it. There we go. Where is that? It's earlier this year. Several people forwarded me um, some interesting photos. Uh, where did that go? Stratocat uh, is a good reference for these. There we go. Oh, 
Okay. We download these. How much do these things cost? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, the balloons that we used to fly in Loon would cost between a hundred and two hundred thousand dollars each for a single flight, uh, but hopefully a single flight will get you a month to a year of uh, of actual flight time. So that's a pretty good return on that investment. All right, let's uh, save the image. Two. And save image. Okay, let's open these up. So, all right, let's do the sharing. So this is one, um, I believe, from a couple years ago, seen over, uh, let's see, where was this scene? Hachino City in the, Mag the Miyagi Prefecture in Japan. Uh, it caused a little bit of a local sensation there. And uh, you can see the same sort of solar panel arrays going uh, horizontally out to the sides. We'll switch here. However, actually in this photo, you can see that there's a long boom going fore and aft in between the solar panels, uh, which we think may have contained propellers for experimentation in propulsion. The ones we saw this time around uh, did not seem to have those sort of booms on it. Uh, we'll look at a couple more uh, of the uh, the same balloons from that time. Let's see. It's been a while since I've been streaming, so bear with me on <laughs> pulling things up. Yeah, so here you go. You can see here that uh, it looks a lot more like there is uh, propellers on this short boom here. Let's zoom into that. Let's see if I can highlight this. Mark up. Mark. Yeah, so here. Right, thanks, giant arrow. So there you can see this is what we think were propell propellers here on the fore and aft boom, which the balloon that flew over the US did not appear to have. Uh, it seemed to have a much shorter central section. Uh, and You know, this boom was much shorter. Uh, and these might be also propulsion. It, it really wasn't clear when this flew over Japan uh, what those were. Uh, let's go back to the other photo of the Japanese one. Of, I'm sorry, of the suspected Chinese one that was flying over Japan in 2020, which is very similar, obviously, design and technology here. Uh, let's pull that one back up. So here you can see that's the same balloon we just looked at. Uh, let's see if I can get an arrow on this one, too. There we go. Let's see if we can get that giant arrow or not. Yeah, little arrow. Okay, so here's that same short boom. Uh, and what might be propellers. In this photo, you can see they look a little bit more stick-like. And of course, the solar panel array that goes along here seems to be pretty big. This whole truss seems pretty large. Uh, I'm guessing these panels are probably a half meter by half meter, maybe three quarters of a meter by meter. And so if, if that's the case, uh, that would be one, two, three, four, five. So that's this, this looks about right. So that's five or six meters on either side. Um, and this looks like maybe like three meters. So it's a truss that's big, pretty big, but it's manageable to launch. A lot of the problems with balloon hardware are in trying to get it off the ground without it scraping things or crashing into equipment and so forth. Yeah, so the question of how much does it cost... Um, 
That's a good one. It's uh, it's kind of hard to estimate, but given the complexity of this and the the low number of these that we think China has made, um, um, I would probably guess you know from two hundred to three hundred thousand for this, uh, depending on how big it is. Uh, some people have said it's much bigger than the loon balloons, and in that case, maybe. 300 to 400,000. So they aren't small investments. And that's really due to the large R&D cost. And the delicate nature of the balloon itself. Uh, it's, it's really hard to make a balloon that will actually stay up in the air for long periods of time without leaking helium. And that is what uh, Loon Project Loon took um, about eight years to finally uh, to, hold on one second, to, to finally actually crack that nut of keeping up in the air. Okay. Let's go find the current. I've got some pretty good uh, photos of the current setup, the current balloon, so we can compare the two side by side. Uh -huh. Where are they? All the parts of the undercarriage. Good questions. Uh, hold on, let me download these, fold these balloons again. The modern ones. I keep forgetting where I stored them, so I just pulled them out of Facebook messages again. Da -da. There we go, let's make this a little easier. And just pull all of these together. Okay. Okay, I've got these pictures up now. Window, share, preview. Here we go. Okay, so this is the current balloon that was shot over the US this past week. Was shot, yes. Now it has been shot, uh, but this is uh, a photograph, obviously. So I'm only asking before I geek out on the parts and use terms I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, so the, the general rod that goes from end to end here, um, you probably can't see my cursor, can you? Let's, uh, again, we'll draw a little squiggly line here. So this rod here is what you would call a truss. And that uh, is simply like a web of triangles of metal. You've probably seen trusses and bridges and cranes and things like that. And it's just a, a very strong, lightweight way to build essentially a structure that's skinny and long. And um, this, of course, is the envelope, what you would call the envelope of the balloon. Uh, it's, thank you, uh, Silent. It's nice to remember that uh, some people, uh, most people would not be familiar with the technological n uh, nomenclature of this. So again, uh, the red circle here, the actual balloon, uh, we refer to as the envelope. And that's a, a very old term. Let's see, what else have we got here? Um, these blue squares are solar panels. Uh, and those are simply this, they're the same as solar panels on your roof or in any other application. They're there to generate electrical power from the sun. As balloons that fly for weeks or months uh, can't carry fuel for that amount of time, uh, they simply rely on the helium keeping them up in the air at a steady support um, and to actually move anywhere or to keep their satellite comms or their cameras or their altitude control systems functioning, they've all got to be powered by solar panels. And the question is, do you have to rely on radiating heat from the panels like the ISS? And that's a great question. Uh, all solar panels do heat up because they are absorbing solar radiation and they're not converting all of it into electricity. And there is a, there's sort of an efficiency limit where as they get hotter and hotter, their electrical efficiency goes down. And so you do need to keep them below a certain temperature to make them a reasonable um, you know, option. And that's not really necessary here in the stratosphere. 
because it's very, very cold up there. The air temperature in the daytime is typically negative 40 C. And at night, it can get as low as negative 100 C. Um, let's see what that is in Fahrenheit. Uh, ah, it's cold. No, it's uh, negative. Uh, it can get as cold as negative 148 degrees Fahrenheit. While the air is not very dense, meaning it doesn't have the ability to, to actually remove heat from things very well. Um, like it's very weak, like radiators and like CPU coolers would be very bad at their jobs up there at removing heat. It does have the ability to remove some heat and such a vast temperature differential from a solar panel that might be, um, you know, without the air might be 50 C it's going to probably be able to reduce that down to zero C, uh, with no problem. And that's a, that's a fine operating range for a solar panel. And at night, while it would be even easier to cool them, it's not really an issue. So here we'll go to a, a better photo yet of the balloon, a really pretty photo. Uh, and you can see the, the solar panels, uh, more easily. And in this one, it does look like, uh, oops, wrong tool. This one, it does look like they have little gaps in here between the panels, uh, and that would imply that these aren't full uh, single solar panel assemblies, but that they have little strip cells uh, that are held um, in an array. And that's probably just on a plastic sheet that's held tight by a frame. Uh, as using metal frames or metal supports, uh, to hold like metal rigid things is very weight prohibitive. Uh, balloons are just like a submarine. Um, their whole life is spent balancing weight versus the amount of buoyancy they have. So they can carry more useful things if they're not carrying more metal that's just holding things. So these solar panels, if they're like the Project Loon panels are probably uh, supported by carbon fiber frames on uh, a plastic panel, plastic solar panel. Um, so as we were saying before, there's a, a truss that runs down the length of this, uh, and that's simply uh, what you might call a space frame. Uh, it's probably a triangular carbon fiber um, truss like you'd see on the space station or bridges or anything like that. Now the, the rest of the details in here are kind of vague. On previous iterations of this balloon, uh, those were um, appeared to be propellers. Uh, this is a photo taken over Japan a couple years ago. Um, and you can see uh, a little bit more here. These these six devices here look look like propellers, particularly uh, this one that uh, how this one is at a clearly different angle than this one. So it seems to be either rotating or have stopped rotated in a different direction. Um, just one second. Let's block that spam. There we go. So, yeah, we're not really sure what this is, but it is clearly uh, some busy stuff. Uh, it's, you know, probably imaging equipment, uh, satellite communications, quite possibly batteries. Uh, and in the middle here, um, generally you have like your flight control systems in the middle and your payloads a little more spread out, your payloads that actually do stuff. That's because the, the flight control systems uh, will often need to keep themselves warm and communicate with the balloon itself. Um, and you usually in balloon systems, balloon programs, you develop a pretty common core of electronics and control devices and batteries uh, that you gen that you then just build extra payloads build extra exper experiments around and leave your core control system uh, on its own any other questions here there's more pictures of the the same uh, similar balloon China flew over Japan about three years ago.
Again, uh, highlighting what appears to be the propellers here. So let me uh, pull up a picture of Project Loon Balloons, uh, which I was a, uh, a member. Photos. I worked on Loon for several years. Balloons. There's my albums. Balloons. Lots of balloons. Let's see. Let's find a balloon that is fully inflated. I did a lot of test work uh, of these balloons. There's a nice one. Can I copy that? Hmm. Apple's photo app has gotten worse and worse every year for trying to just get photos out of the darn thing. Okay, let's export. There we go. Okay, so the Project Loon balloons, you'll see, look markedly different from this balloon. There we go. Okay, so this is a balloon that Google flew, well, that we inflated inside a giant hangar, uh, but it is a balloon that Google, the style that Google flew. And you'll see here that this is transparent. And generally, that's... There's two reasons why you would make a transparent balloon instead of a opaque balloon like the Chinese balloon seems to be. Uh, and that is the ability to not absorb solar radiation, to let, suns, to let some sunlight pass through and out the other side so that you don't heat up your helium and increase your pressure. And the other is to save on weight. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Mass is a real driver of what you can do with your balloon. The lighter your balloon is, the more equipment and experiments and batteries and solar panels you can lift with the balloon. And that's a, that's a big deal because it's hard to make a big balloon and you want to get every ounce of productivity, you can't literally ounces, grams, productivity out of the balloon that you can for a given amount of money. Just skim back to the, the Japanese one for a minute. So another question, could you determine from the pictures more of the type of construction, e.g. if that was a super pressure balloon with an internal air ballast, ballonet like the loon balloons? That's a great question, dingbats, like the old font. Yes. Oh, hey, Phil. Um, Phil says, what sort of payload mass could you expect with a balloon of this approximate size? Do we have a similar estimate for how large the Chinese one might have been? Um, well, let's start with a loon balloon to sort of tie Phil's and Dingbat's questions together here. So the loon balloons were super pressure balloons and the optimal shape for a super pressure is this, this sort of pumpkin shape. And there's a mathematical reason for that that I can't remember at the moment, but this is just like a grocery store balloon where uninflated it is a flat circle when you inflate it the two halves fill up and they form little wrinkles around the edges and when you put ropes in all those wrinkles and tighten those ropes uh, you can increase the pressure far beyond what you would be able to pressurize it without the ropes with just bare plastic, it would pop at probably 1 20th of the pressure uh, that you could get. And the reason this is called super pressure is that it is pressurized compared to the air around it. When you have a fixed volume and a payload mass that doesn't change, that means is you get to float along at a, at a constant altitude. Again, just like a submarine does until it releases air or releases air or compresses air. I can't remember. But anyway, because we have a constant volume and a constant mass, we will float at the same air density as the balloon's density. Now, if you want to go up or down with this type of balloon, you have to add mass or release mass. And the way you do that uh, is what Dingbats has referred to, 
which is an internal air, air ballast ballonet, like the loon balloons. This balloon, it's hard to see. Um, in fact, let me pull up a different loon balloon picture. That'll make it much easier to, to see the, to see the ballonet, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a, kind of an ailing balloon, but uh, let's just see how these two look. I was there for a lot of the testing of the loon balloons in the old airship hangars at uh, the Moffett Field in uh, Sunnyvale, California. All right, let's add these these pictures in here. So, all right, ignoring the fact that the outer envelope of this balloon is very unhappy, you can see the in the inner air ballonet, and that is inflated by air through a pump that compresses it from the outside into that bag. When it does that, it compresses the helium outside the bag, while the outer envelope, the pumpkin shape, remains a constant volume. So you raise the pressure in the balloon, but in fact, as you pump more air in, the balloon goes down to an altitude where the air pressure in the balloon essentially reaches close to the air pressure outside the balloon. Um, so you don't really change the risk of bursting the balloon very much when you do this air pumping or air releasing. Um, yeah, so the, uh, right. So it's going back to my mention of how ropes allow you to pressurize a balloon far higher than if it was just a sphere. Uh, that's, that's a serious thing because if you, Hmm. The reason why a balloon pops is because it reaches a pressure that stretches the material to the point of the material's breaking point. And your balloon's pressure and your longevity against leaks is determined by the amount of tension your film can withstand, how early it's going to burst. And if you want more helium moles, longer flight times, you've got to have higher pressures. And the math works out that a wide curve is going to um, increase the tension in the film far sooner when pressure is applied than a tight curve. When the same pressure is applied, the tension in the film is much less. So to get more pressure in the balloon, you have to have a smaller curve and not a wider curve. So these ropes, as you can see, are restraining the balloon into little curves. Instead of the one seven meter radius, you now have one meter or less radius curves here, which allow you to run high pressure. And you'll notice, here's a, here's a much better picture of that. You will notice that the Japanese balloon does not really have well-defined, sorry, the Chinese balloon. Uh, these were spotted over Japan a couple years ago. Chinese balloon doesn't seem to have those pumpkin gores, those pumpkin valleys. What it seems to look like is while there are stripes up and down, you don't see the little curved pumpkin sections. And of a a balloon of this size, uh, which we think is fairly big, really has to have those lobes. It cannot fly without those lobes. And we can tell the fact that A, physics, that it has to have a pumpkin, and B, that you can see the, the shape of this envelope is not a perfect sphere. There's some, um, let's see, there's some uh, like negative curvature here and negative curvature here. And while you do see um, some striations, let's get rid of those. You do see obviously some striations here and here. They don't seem to actually indicate much geometrical indentation. Like a balloon of this size uh, should look like this if it's a real super pressure balloon. However, doesn't mean it's not one of those. What um, we suspect is that this balloon is, oh, I forget the exact numbers, but probably 50 meters in diameter. And uh, 
I'm not exactly settled on its size, but if it's 50 meters in diameter, uh, the envelope may weigh upwards of 2,000 kilos, which might be able to lift a 1,000 kilo truss here, which is pretty big. But uh, anyway, I forgot where I was going with that. Right. So with that kind of mass, if you're going to be flying for a very long period of time, uh, you've got to have the pumpkin. However, as I mentioned, one of the reasons why you make a balloon clear is so that the helium isn't heated much by the sun. And the reason why heating helium is important, <laughs> not heating helium is important, is so that the pressure doesn't go up in the daytime. And that's because of the old uh, PV equals NRT gas law, where increasing temperature in a fixed size pressure vessel or a fixed volume balloon means when temperature goes up, your pressure increases. And when your pressure increases, you have to make sure that never reaches the point of where your film is going to tear. So that increase in pressure in the, the height of the daytime, when the balloon cools at night, the decrease in pressure. There's two conditions there. I just mentioned that it can't pop in the daytime, but at night you have another problem, which is the pressure can't reach zero. You can't have the balloon go floppy. And that's because this equation of keeping mass and volume steady to stay at a particular altitude. Even if your mass is constant, if your balloon volume changes, you're going to start sinking. So to maintain control and altitude stability, you have to make sure this doesn't get to zero pressure. My music is getting off. It's getting off topic here. Let's go back. So yeah, that's what gives you the minimum pressure required to sustain the daytime and the, uh, sorry, the maximum required to sustain in the daytime and the minimum at night. And if you can reduce the amount of temperature input from the sun, that means the noontime pressure is less. And so you can actually run a weaker plastic or weaker design if you don't have to withstand such a high pressure in the middle of the day. So what my suspicion is going on here, excuse me, is that there is a pumpkin underneath a fabric shell. This appears to be a white solar radiation reflecting fabric that is draped over a pumpkin super pressure balloon. And that reason would be obvious, which is keeping the temperature cool. This has rarely been done in super pressure balloons, however, because of the added mass of that extra fabric is a lot of mass, probably doubling the mass of your entire balloon. And by doubling your mass, you're cutting your payload in half which means if you want to lift the same payload, you have to increase the balloon size by a lot more, which is then heavier because of the balloon. It's an equation that eventually reaches uh, a point where the balloon is too heavy to lift itself. So there's a sweet spot where your particular weight of the balloon film uh, gives you an opt optimal payload. So it's pretty neat that they've actually applied a white reflective cover to this, uh, this pumpkin shaped balloon. I've never seen that done in the modern era, uh, successfully anyway. And you'll notice um, we're probably right about that um, because of what you see here. Whoops, that's a very not helpful thing right there. What you see here, come on circle, you can do it. Maybe, can you not do it? There we go. What you see here, this is a, a very broad reflection from the sun and you can see that it also is reflecting from the gores the strips of the fabric going up and down which means it is fairly shiny uh, which is exactly what you would expect um, it's pretty neat on, honestly um, and it's tech that we could learn from and i'm sure uh, the rest of the world will quickly investigate this so um, 
more payloads here. More questions here. Chai Town wanted to get an expert opinion on the hot mess of downing the China balloon. So um, we're avoiding uh, the political aspect of any of this stuff, but the uh, the actual technical um, the technical situation of the flight termination of this balloon is still fairly interesting. So as we saw, do I need to bring up the video? I guess I probably should. Give me a few moments here. Um, stand by while I look this video up in a format that doesn't have all kinds of overlays. Let's uh, uh, uh. There we go. your question right here. I'm trying to find the really good one I saw. I wasn't originally going to play the video on the stream, but it is fairly interesting. And it does uh, indicate what the balloon is doing, what the balloon is uh, is made of. So, give me a minute here to find the good video. So Stratocat uh, at Strato Balloon is the world's resource for all balloon uh, science and engineering news, a clearinghouse, as it were. Where um, you can go to their website, uh, Stratocat.ar. Uh, let me throw that up on the screen here before we put the video on. Um, great guy, um, and worth following their Twitter. works. There we go. Where's our little screen? Uh, and at Strato Balloon Twitter. There you go. Okay, let's bring up uh, Twitter there. Strato Cat's Twitter. So this is the best video I have found of the, uh, the maneuver, the intercept. So we'll play this from the beginning in real time, then we'll step through it. Let's 
Okay, let's go back to the beginning and zoom in and hit it in, sli uh, in real time. Let's do that one more time. Let's zoom in a little more. Can I zoom in more? Quite in the mood. Close enough, though. You'll notice here that um, the intercepting projectile I can't step this frame by frame, so we're just gonna. Yeah. So you saw the the flash and this uh, the streak. Uh, of smoke to the right occurred at the bottom of the balloon and it, yeah exactly at chi town it hit the payload uh, and that is very telling uh, and it's very you know predictable um, so, i'm sorry the music has has gotten uh, overly loud yeah so th the projectile hitting the payload um, instead of the balloon is very telling like you might think that's unintuitive because the US might want the payload and might want to just hit the balloon. But I'm, you know, I'm what I'm going to say here is probably not, you know, the military probably has more capabilities than I know they do. But what we know is that the military does not generally have the ability to target big bags of nothing. Um, yeah, so it's probably very hard to hit it with a powered munition, uh, and to hit it with bullets is uh, is counterproductive. Um, it's a balloon that's 50 meters in diameter uh, is going to take. If you put 100 bullet holes in it, it might take two days to come down, maybe three days, maybe five days. And it's going to come down really slowly, just creeping down towards the ground. And you don't know where it's going to land. You don't know how far it's going to go. In addition to it being very hard to hit when you're traveling at 600 miles an hour uh, and you're, you're just going to fly right by it as you're in gun range, it's very quickly going to pass behind you. So the payload having a, a radar signature makes sense that they targeted uh, the payload. That big truss, the solar panels, uh, the electronics, the batteries, those are all reflective of radio waves. Um, and it made it a logical choice to just terminate the, uh, the hardware system at the bottom. Um, so let me go back to some questions. We'll, we'll talk more about this video in a minute. Um, come back to that. So does it take 10,000 bullets to take one of these things down? No. Um, I mean, certainly that would do it. Uh, the more bullets, the faster. Um, but generally, you know, it's like poking, I don't know, like poking a very small hole in a garbage bag full of water. Like if you poke like a needle hole or a tiny, like a one millimeter hole in a garbage bag full of water, yeah, stuff's going to leak out of it, but it's going to take a long time to empty the bag. So, you know, it's just a matter of how long do you want to wait, uh, or how many bullets you could get through it. Can you guesstimate that from the size of the solar arrays what the power budget was? I vaguely remember Loon had something around 1.3 kilowatts. Um, that's a good question. So um, the Loon power panels were 70 centimeters by 70 centimeters, and those panels uh, at peak efficiency generated 165 watts of power. Uh, Loon ran eight of those, so let's do the math. Uh, 165 times eight. Uh, yeah, that's 1.3 kilowatts. Interesting, Zap. Thing bats. You know your Loon um, to the T. Interesting. Um, do I know you anyway? <laughs> um, yeah. So from these panels. Um, we, we can guesstimate the size of these panels. Let's go back to the uh, the actual window that has the pictures. So was this the best solar panel pick? I think it might have been. And again, these, these 
light blue sky ones were from when a similar balloon flew over Japan in 2020. Um, you can see it clearly had um, a fewer, does it have fewer panels? Let's count these. Uh, it's one on the right hand side, one, two, three, four, five, six rows of panels, and the one here over the US had Interesting, only four rows of panels on each side. You've just read Loon Library a lot. It's pretty cool that we finally released some of the information from Loon. Um, it's kind of sad and unfortunate that we didn't release the 98% of information that's not in that document that really we pushed humanity forward in terms of capability of exploration. But anyway, that's a complaint for another day. Yeah, so these panels, interesting that they cut down to four on each side, and I think we can guess why. Before, we, well, let's let's do the panel numbers, then then I want you to guess why. Um, so I haven't done the calculations, but uh, if we assume that the the balloon is fifty meters wide and wide, um, I don't know. I'd say twenty five to fifty. All right. If these, we did this earlier in the stream, I have a terrible memory. If these panels are, let's say, a meter square, then we have four meters from the center, give it another meter to the end of the truss, so that's five meters, so that's a 10 meter, uh, give it another two meters, so that is six meters to the core, from, to the tip of the trucks truss so that's about a 12 meter wide boom yeah that's about right from what i'm seeing on the balloon the balloon's probably closer to 25 or 30 meters but uh given this if the panels are one meter square so assuming they're like loons maybe give them give them a meter let's just bump the uh the power up to you know 175 watts uh so that so we've got uh, 16 panels here times 175. Uh, you've got, uh, Dan doesn't do math well in his head. So that's 2.8 kilowatts. Um, so yeah, that's a decent amount of power. And that's, that's probably about right. Uh, you'll, let's go back to the uh, original, the early ones from 2020, uh, where you see, where we see a lot more panels. If we can assume these are the same size panels, which, whoops, which I don't know that we can, but let's assume they're the size of loon panels and let's count them up. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six rows. So that's 12 panels on each side. So 24 panels per, per payload. So that's 24 times 165. So that's four kilowatts. Um, it's a nice round number. That's probably about correct for what they were generating. Now, can, given that this particular balloon three years, uh, three years ago, yeah, three years ago, seems to have propellers at the tip of the trusses, that would indicate why the current model does not have so many solar panels. Powering a propulsion system is requires a lot of power. So that, that does also kind of indicate that they don't have a propulsion system on this balloon. And that, that pretty much checks out because propulsion on a round balloon is just a dumb idea, honestly. Like, you can do it, but the fact that the balloon is not aerodynamically shaped and the actual vector of the propulsion uh, is from below on a string means the propulsion is just going to swing the string forward and backwards and forward and the balloon is going to act like a big dragging air anchor to exacerbate that. Uh, so if your vector of your thrust vector is not through the center of drag like an airships, it's just a bad it's just dumb it, it, like we've tried it uh, other people have tried it just because you got to see if it might work or help but yeah so they gave up on it which makes sense or at least this is not that model uh, let me go back to the questions 
Did I miss some? Yeah, so power budget. Yeah. Um. How was it able to maneuver itself by Chai Town? Um, so uh, it, given that there's no propulsion on this, uh, there's only one way you can maneuver, and that is drifting with the wind. And if you want to drift elsewhere, uh, not with the wind, you have to go up or down and find uh, altitudes where the wind winds are blowing in a different direction than they are currently where you are. And that's exactly how Loon navigated. The action of pumping air into the balloon's ballonet, or releasing the mass of air from the ballonet, uh, is what allows you to climb to a less dense altitude, or a higher density altitude, where the air is higher density. Allows you to find the different wind levels and you just go up and down based on the weather forecast to see if the winds are going where you want. And it's a nice day when you have winds that are going like this, because then you can just choose where where you want to go. Um, and some days, all of the winds at all the altitudes are going that way. Um, and that's just a not great day, because you're going wherever they're going uh, without sort of steering control. Um, so yeah, so that's maneuvering, and that uh, is actually what uh, somebody referenced. Uh, that's a lot of power to, to for scientific instruments, uh, and it is, uh, and that's because most of the power goes into the high-speed turbine, the turbo compressor that puts that thin, thin air uh, puts a lot of air mass into the balloon's ballonet at reasonably high differential pressure. And so Loon's, for example, was uh, ran at 60,000 RPM, and it drew 400 watts of power. Um, 400 watts is a lot of power. When we were talking about the uh, balloon generating 1.3 kilowatts peak, that's daytime, like equatorial sun. Most of the time, uh, the panels are not at the perfect angle. The panels were fixed in Loon at a particular angle, so the sun was not always pointing at them, and when the sun is lower, it's going through more atmosphere, so less uh, light reaches your panel. So 1.3 kilowatt peak means to support a 400 watt air blower, uh, you know, a good chunk of the day, you're barely going to be keeping ahead of the, uh, the compressor. And at night, you've had to charge all your batteries on top of running your air compressor periodically. So. Yeah, it's a lot of the balloon's power uh, goes just to navigation, even if there's no propeller. So, yeah, scientific instruments uh, take a shockingly little part of the balloon's power budget, and that is nothing suspicious about that, uh, whatever your electronics are. Uh, now, giant laser beams, that's another thing, but that's more fun than engineering. So, I would think that trying to make the debris smaller might be a better plus non-reflective target might be better. Um, Chi Town, can you elaborate on making the debris smaller? Um, let's see. Phil says, hey Phil, by the way, do the transparent balloons help with solar power by not shading the panels so much? Yes. Or is the material relatively opaque to the frequencies that the photovoltaics use? Um, they really do give you a little bit of uh, <laughs> a little bit of not being screwed around noon. Um, and we early in Loon, we discovered the effect of that uh, plotted out over time um, is a curve that uh, I'm going to draw on top of one of these photos because I don't have a good. Uh, uh, these are all. <laughs> These are all balloons that, uh, if I got a blank canvas I can draw on here, um, I bet I can make one. Uh, yeah, I'll just screenshot a blank window. Here we go. Uh, pardon me, it's been a long time since I've done a, a real good stream. Uh, okay, so let's do a little drawing here. So with... Uh, with time on our x-axis, so this is t, 
and nope, I don't want to move that. And we have power on the y axis here. As your day goes, uh, as your day starts here in the beginning, uh, you, you start to have a rising power as the sun rises. As the sun gets higher and higher, closer to your solar panel angle, you get a lot more, that's not quite it. You start to get a lot more power. But as the sun starts to go above the edge of the balloon, you get a, a sharp, is that right? Yeah, you get a very sharp cutoff in power. And because it is opaque and the sun is still rising over the balloon, um, initially the balloon is having the sun come through the plastic long ways along the edge of the balloon. So a lot of the light gets reflected or just trapped. But as the sun continues on up over the balloon shoulder, you now just have two layers of film uh, that are letting the sun through. So you have this quick chop and then slowly towards noon, uh, you're getting better. And then in the afternoon, that, that process reverses uh, until the sun comes to the edge uh, and then passes the edge uh, and then starts uh, the typical uh, daytime descent towards night. And you can probably see what we named this in Loon, which is uh, which we all loved. Uh, we named it the Batman curve, uh, which is your what you get here, as you were saying, uh, with the daytime noon in the center here and your solar panel power output on the y axis. It was pretty neat. We didn't know that was going to happen, but uh, when we plotted it out, we were amused. Okay, so I'm getting behind the questions here, um, but I'll get to I'll get you I'll get you all here. Phil says, I guess the payload is quite a long way down, so maybe not a huge factor for most of the day. Yeah, Phil, um, that's a good point. Um, that is why the payload is that far down. I can guarantee you that's why it's that long. Uh, otherwise there's a huge amount of negatives to having your payload that far from the balloon, um, uh, including it's very hard to rotate against a string, whereas if you're coupled strongly and firmly to the balloon envelopes, massive inertia, you can turn things very reliably and smoothly or fast uh, without your attachment point just rotating in the opposite direction. And this is important for sun tracking and also things like dish you know communication dishes um things like that uh, let's see and when you have a clear balloon um you can kind of get away with having it pretty close to the the envelope that's how loon was able to do it only a meter only two meters below the balloon because they had a transparent envelope uh, and that two meters was a rigid pipe so they could do the, the torquing uh, maneuvers uh, against the balloon's inertia very nicely. Um, but, uh, let's go back to me. I'm sure you would all love to see me better than a curve. Um, let's see. Looks like typical panels run in about 300 to 700 nanometers, so that's pretty much the entire visible spectrum. Relatively transparent then. Uh, yeah, depending on your plastic material that you choose, uh, but typically um, the balloons that Loon used were polyethylene or blends of polyethylene and nylons and various other things that were proprietary, um, but they're fairly optically transparent. You also want them to be infrared transparent, um, and that's, that's, always, that's not always predictable about what kind of film will be transparent in both ranges, but um, it's a balancing trade space. Um, the interesting part of ballooning is you have a lot of things that are competing for an optimal balloon system. Like we just talked about, how much can you not absorb heat? Well, a plastic that might be great at passing through light might, might absorb infrared light, which is gonna add heat. Or one that's really great at being transparent to all wavelengths of light and heat might be weak and unable to be pressurized. Um, or it might degrade quickly with UV radiation. So 
it's a fascinating but very hard struggle to optimize these things. And again, when you don't have to run as much pressure, it's okay uh, to use weaker fabric or weaker film. But again, that means you gotta have less temperature input. Um, mm. How plausible is it that the navigation capability failed, as China said, so it drifted over North America? But when the U.S. complained, it somehow steered successfully to the coast. Um, very. Oh, well. Just a second. Got hungry. Um, just a second. I'll be right back. Okay, so I'll address the first one first, the first question, part of that question first. Um, how plausible is it that the navigation capability failed? Very plausible. <laughs> Balloons are fucking hard. They really are. Uh, not just the balloon itself, but the equipment that you're hanging off it the termination systems that are bolted to it, the me mechanical things that have to sp spin at high, rev uh, high revs, that have to you know, even move at low revolutions. And the reasons why mechatronics uh, and electronics have such a hard time is that temperature swing of negative 40 to negative 100 C on external components it, that's a huge swing. And when you think about it, they also have to work at plus 50 C on the ground. So that means you have an operating temperature range of all of your metals uh, that are exposed of 150 degrees Celsius. Nothing is designed for that, except maybe satellites. Uh, and that's the sort of thing you have to start getting into is really complicated calculations of uh, thermal expansion of different materials and heating of circuit boards and heating of fairings and heating of motors, um, things like that to get things back into a compatible uh, temperature range. Whoops, getting all distracted. Actually have to remove this seal. Yeah, so navigation fail is pretty common in balloons, particularly in uh, early development vehicles in uh, throughout history, uh, just because stuff is unreliable in those temperature ranges and it's very hard to test them for six months in those conditions. Um, there's so many projects throughout history that had uh, control failures and drifted into other countries out of control. Um, Project Loon, not being an exception to that trend, um, I can remember at least five times, uh, and I, I was not privy to all of the flight details. I was busy with other stuff there. At least five times when we lost control and just barged on through, apologizing to everyone <laughs> as we went by or over through their airspace. Um, Got to tell you, it doesn't make anyone happy with you. So yes, it's a very plausible explanation. Um, and that, what makes that more plausible is that, um, I really should verify this, but someone posted a reverse uh, weather, a reverse wind prediction that would show that if it, if its navigation control had failed and it just stayed at a constant altitude, it would have drifted from China to here if no navigation was performed, this is exactly what it would have done, just free floating. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't predict that path and start it at the right time with no navigation and make it here, uh, but it is a plausible explanation. Um, let's see, what else, what other part of that question? 
Um, steered to the coast. Uh, I haven't kept up with that. Um, steering with steering to the coast. Um, hmm, I should look into that. That would require an altitude change, um, and that's very easy to predict. Very easy to demonstrate an altitude change uh, because the path will deviate from the wind at the level the balloon is at. Um, hmm. Maybe later I'll run the numbers. It's kind of boring to run that kind of a prediction, um, but interesting. Uh, it just involves me poking around a lot of numbers, but you get a cool map out of it that does explain um, whether or not it maneuvered. Um, so let's move on. Chi-Town makes sense as far as the energy requirement for movement versus the, for the equipment. I learned something new today. As far as hitting the payload versus the balloon, you explained the reason why hitting the balloon would not have worked. So the question was answered just after the question was typed. Um, yeah, it, it's very hard for active tracking munitions to see the balloon, if they can at all. Yep. Um, and balloon payloads are not optimized for radar cross-sections. Um, A, because normally you don't expect to have to deal with that. Um, and B, it takes a lot of mass, a lot of weight. That means if you have all this material that's radar absorbing, that's material you can't use. That's weight you've lost for actual functionality. Okay. Curve of the power curve looks like a gremlin. Got it. Yep. Batman or gremlin. Yes. Um, Bob, why did Loon have multiple panel elevation angles then? Saw it hanging up at the Smithsonian. Oh, that's awesome. I heard one of them was going to the Smithsonian, but I actually didn't hear if it, uh, if, if it got hung up. That's cool. Uh, well, I believe one of my things is actually on that. I, uh, I should go check. It would be pretty cool. Uh, I had a sensor that flew on the altitude control turbine uh, on every flight that sensed uh, if there was helium leaking into the air ballonet. Hey, that means I might have something in the Smithsonian. <laughs> Just realized that. Um, definitely going to have to tell Dad. Did it need different charge circuits to handle different panel performance? Um, the multiple panel elevation angles was to deal with the fact that of what we were talking about, which is um, the panel elevation angles were fixed for Loon. Uh, and again, that's simply to save on mass and uh, reliability of rotating the panels. If you do the trade space, it's not worth the mass hit um, versus of a mechatronic system versus just adding a couple of more panels that are angled at a more optimal angle for noontime power input. And that's, that's the calculus on that. Uh, one of the uh, side notes about the Loon panels that were made custom uh, by SunPower in France, um, I'll give you guys a little treat. I have, uh, have close-up photos of the Loon balloon panels. Give me a moment here. I think you'll enjoy these quite nicely. <laughs> Did my music just go off? Yeah, going back. Panels, panels, panels. They're really, really pretty, pretty devices. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, the Loon solar panels uh, were made custom by SunPower in France, and they are uh, they're on a film, a film backer that is transparent. Um, really, did I not get pictures of these pretty panels up close? I'd be quite disappointed if I didn't. Uh, oops. Um, yeah, I was uh, I was around a lot of these panels. Um, oh, I remember at the Loon launch site in Winnemucca. I think I got a good shot at a couple of these panels. I used to work at the launch site outdoors on the helium and hydrogen uh, filling machines a lot. 
it was very miserable working day and night all year round. Basically, you get to go to Burning Man, it's right near there, but not have fun. <laughs> get to have all the excitement and pleasure of working outdoors in the desert. I know I got some good pictures. I was bored at one point and just wandered around the uh, payload prep facility. Yeah, it was... Hey, hey! There we go! Beautiful, beautiful... Um, export. Let's see, time was... Wow, who, who just raided? Volcano Doc! Hey, hey, thank you for the raid. It's great to see you, by the way. I saw you were sciencing today. Um, everybody, welcome in. Um, this is fun. It's been a while since I've been raided. Uh, what we're talking about today is the science of long-duration stratospheric balloons, which the Chinese spy balloon uh, is a great example of. Uh, right now, we are talking about how power is generated for all the systems on board the balloon, which is solar uh, solar panels. Um, all right, I'm going to have to shrink the font size on this chat window, or I'm going to lose track of it here. Okay. Um, let's take a look at the panels here. Uh, they're beautiful, beautiful custom solar panels. Uh, optimized for stratospheric use. Um, I have never seen prettier, more perfect panels for balloons. Uh, and I've seen a few panels, but I mean, not a lot. They, uh, these are the 165 uh, watt panels. And these are, where are they? There they are. Okay, let's uh, take a look. I'll bring that window up for you. There it is. Okay, so this is one of the Loon solar panels. And you're looking at the backside of it. Let me just make sure there's no urgent messages here. Hey, Volcano Doc, I see. Excited to learn. Yeah, stick around. Um, okay, yeah, I'm actually up to date on all the questions. So, you seem to be shaking up and down. Sorry, it was just a little earthquake here. Um, just kidding. Just kidding, Volcano Doc. Um, okay, so this is the 165-watt Loon solar panel uh, built by SunPower in France. And we're looking at the backside. And you'll notice that we can see every cell, every individual cell, even though we're behind the panel. And what that means is this panel generates power from both sides of the panel. That means sunlight coming on the front generates power, and then any light bouncing off the Earth's surface or clouds comes in the bottom side and gives you more power. In fact, on a, a full day of a cloud cover with high albedo, I think we could get 20% power boost over just a uh, front panel solar input. And that's something that only a balloon can really take advantage of. And it's a beautiful, elegant situation. Uh, and you'll notice it's on a plastic sheet. Just a, it's a floppy piece of plastic that is uh, just stretched by these carbon fiber rods that go out to all the corners. And uh, so it's super lightweight, super fragile, because these are silicon solid solar cells here. Um, they're the, the latest generation of sun power, the Max, Max something, beautiful blue on the front. I don't have any pictures of those. Again, mostly carbon fiber truss structure on the Loon. Uh, systems. Uh, by the way, for you new uh, raiders, uh, I am um, former, I worked on Google's project Loon uh, for many years, uh, and this is how I have some pictures of the former deceased project Loon hardware. Okay, so, and you see here, um, there are lots of solar panels on the balloon that went by this week. Okay. Any new questions? Yeah, cloud illumination is nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, albedo. Hey, Volcano Doc, no worries. <laughs> Take a break. Thanks for bringing everybody in.
Okay, Dingbat, the high split wind model agrees that it could have just drifted by itself to the coast from Montana. Thanks for explaining why navigation feature failure is likely option. Thanks for checking, Dingbats. I, uh, <laughs> I have to imagine you are a balloonist. Uh, you have to ping me later and tell me, uh, who you are lurking. Um, but welcome, everybody. So, Chris, I've seen my fair share of balloons out of Almogordo. Uh, I'll bet you have. Uh, that's the typical site of uh, the Air Force and the NASA balloons, uh, I believe. Are, are you talking about the, the Air Force Research Lab or just the uh, NASA University of New Mexico? I forget who runs the, uh, the launch site there in New Mexico. Uh, Silent, how is communication usually done with the balloon? Satellite is the norm or just radio? These types of balloons can fly for a month up to a year. And in that time, they will transit the Earth. They will circumnavigate the planet many times uh, because their wind, the winds are just not always going in their favor. Uh, and you will have to, you know, you give up trying to hang out uh, where you wanted to hang out and you end up just drifting away. And you've got to wait about a week as you drift around the planet, steering a little bit to avoid countries that don't like you, and you come back around the other side um, and try and do some lingering over where you want to hang out again. And that's, by the way, why uh, to serve customers over a particular region, you need a fleet. You can't just have one or two because they they won't hang around on some days. And you, you have to have some sort of waiting upwind in the wings, probably over the ocean, ready to divert into land and cover the area you want, as Project Loon did for many years in their test sites of Puerto Rico, um, Peru, and Kenya, actually. Yeah, so <laughs> getting to your question of satellites versus radio. So yeah, uh, satellite is the norm. Uh, typically, balloons made by uh, US commercial entities uh, are done with the Iridium constellation. Uh, out of all the satellite networks, it's just a win for its properties and its technical power usage, its uh, mass of modems, its style of antennas uh, are all very compact. It's uh, it's also very good coverage around the planet, though it is very low bandwidth. Um, we get to send about 500 bytes a minute as a text message, basically. That's good enough to get telemetry status of sensors and to send commands up to the balloon uh, to control it, like to tell it to change altitudes or change modes or things like that. Um, radio is sometimes used for short range like high bandwidth connections like if you wanted to get a live video stream down from the balloon or uh, downlink gigabytes of imaging or radar data um, you would probably use a local radio link uh, and even for moderately intense telemetry like if i wanted one second packets of telemetry many times i have set up a, a huge antenna to track the balloon as it goes by to establish that you know one megabit link down for the amount of time that it hangs around you know for six hours uh, to do the experiment and then i'm happy if it wanders away and i lose that link um both and festival oh i see yeah festival so chris you may have seen the way that uh, these balloons navigate by going up or down to find wind layers that are going in different directions to allow you to drift in the, the area that you want to drift in uh, is the same way that the balloon festival uh, hot air balloons and gas balloons uh, are able to do their tricks of not just blowing away <laughs> to another place uh, and the way they can actually do the sort of the square um, circuit that the hot air balloons in the festival uh, so often do. So by the way, this is a Project Loon balloon um, project that I worked on. But let's look back at the, the Chinese uh, super pressure balloons uh, for the new people here. I can re-explain a little bit of this. 
This is the balloon uh, that overflowed the U.S. Here's some of the, the better pictures that I was forwarded. Uh, by the way, I'm a, uh, a science balloon consultant, uh, and I have been working on balloons for 15 years. And I worked on Google's Project Loon for about eight years. Uh, and this is the type of balloon that I specialize in, the long duration, super pressure, um, constant altitude balloon. So this is my fun. I'm happy to share it with you guys. So this is the balloon that flew over the U.S. And interestingly, uh, a similar balloon of a prior generation of the Chinese uh, also flew over Japan in 2020 and 2021. Uh, this is a sighting uh, from 2020 um, and similar ones uh, here. As you can see, the, the truss is slightly different. Uh, it has these white pods on the end of the cross arms and the long truss. We see that here. You'll notice these circles are indicating that the angle of this white pod being different from the white pod on the left there. And that's indicative of those probably being propellers uh, experimenting with propulsion. And we discussed how this is that same balloon over Japan, how we see that this upper pod seems to be just a circle uh, and the one on the, the lower part, which I should just draw here. This one seems to be a, uh, oriented in a different direction than this one. So again, these look awfully lot like propellers given the thickness uh, of the upper part varying from the lower part, uh, which would be indicative of blade angles being more towards you uh, on one half of the propeller versus the other half. So these are almost certain propellers over Japan, but um, it is in essence very inefficient to use propulsion on a spherical balloon. And as we saw here on the ones that flew over the US, uh, those are missing. Those are not here anymore. Um, and that makes sense. It's inefficient and it's close enough to just drift with the winds uh, as Project Loon did for like 2000 balloon flights. Okay. At Loon, what circumstances, under what circumstances would a flight termination be triggered? So uh, I'm a little rusty on the actual logic, but I can tell you uh, the typical logic that balloon projects will use, uh, both, um, well, both sides of the coin. So generally, you have uh, at least two completely different technologies for terminating the balloon or the flight. Uh, generally, most modern balloons actually release the helium uh, and keep the balloon under control uh, so that you recover the envelope and the payload. The forceful way is to just cut your payload off the balloon, which forces the balloon to rapidly rise and overpressurize now that it doesn't have enough weight and burst and fall down. That's valid, but it does mean you don't really know where your balloon is going to land um, and it might take a while to come down the other way is to simply open a hole in the top which allows you to release the helium at a controlled rate uh, and then you know how fast it's going to come down and it's going to be a gentle descent that slowly accelerates uh, until it's safe in the lower atmosphere to fire your parachute out uh, for the descent of the payload and the envelope so that's releasing a controlled opening at the top of the balloon, which is Loon's primary method. Uh, they used a, um, a round plate, a round metal plate, that had a dividing centerpiece down the middle. I um, can't remember if I have photos of that or not. But anyway, imagine a, a, a round ring, a plate with a ring in the middle, and that ring was just covered with plastic film, almost like, you know, bread plastic film, which is what the whole balloon is made out of. And in that ring, there was a little arm, a spring loaded arm that was tightly wound. And on the end of that arm was a razor blade held up off the film. And there was a pyrotechnic cutter that when it got one or two volts on it, I think, uh, would ignite and snap a string that was holding this razor blade arm back and the razor blade would drop down into the film and the spring would yank it around the radius of this plate 
causing the plastic film to flap open and the helium to come out. And that's the controlled method. Uh, and Loon actually had two identical uh, systems like this. Uh, one was large and one was slightly smaller uh, so that we could actually have a another entry port for electronic sensors and for gas inputs uh, on one quarter of that metal plate. The other way that large balloons typically do uh, is to use what's called a, um, a rip panel. Uh, oh, there's another term for this, but uh, it's like a rip, not quite a rip cord, but anyway, the way this works is uh, what you desire to do, if this is your balloon, you desire to slice an entire, like, just slice the balloon in half, the film and the balloon will uh, rapidly just burst. Your helium will all leave in about a second time because it's so pressurized and you will definitely start falling quickly. Um, that is uh, the way that like NASA does the really big balloons. Uh, and to do that in a controlled manner, you typically run a, a rope up the outside of the balloon and then inside through a little uh, attachment point to the inside of the balloon and then the rope comes back down the inside surface of the film and you either fire uh, a very high tension winch spring to yank that string that rope and it just the rope pulls itself like this and it just zips uh, a hole just a slot through the plastic film as the rope is pulled down um, sort of like some product bags uh, or mailers where you pull the plastic string and it just zips a hole in the paper or the plastic, a, a strip, a slit. Um, so Loon uh, used that uh, with a very large spring uh, to wind that string onto that uh, a capstan winch. Uh, and I don't think that went all the way down the balloon. The Another way to terminate with this method is to just have that rope attached to your payload and cut your payload off and as your payload falls it yanks that rope slit down to the balloon and causes that termination um, I, loon did not use that method uh, loons balloons and payloads all came down uh, together uh, until landing so the uh, as far as the logic of these systems that's actually fairly interesting um, you need to protect against equipment failure uh, in addition to uh, commanding under your, you know, uh, under your wishes. So remotely, we could command any of these systems independently. And they were all triggered from the same, uh, the same circuit board at the top of the balloon, which was fully self-powered and maintained a communication uh, link with the main payload down below. Whereas the main payload had all the satellite control links and it just talked over a CAN bus protocol through a wire up to the top, uh, the termination board. And uh, there's several bits of logic that the termination board would use to determine when to cut the balloon. One was receiving a command from the main payload. Another was losing, sorry, uh, losing the heartbeat, losing the communications with the main payload. The apex board doesn't necessarily know what's happening, but the main payload would ping back and forth to the apex board just saying, hey, I'm still here, don't worry. I'm still here, don't worry. When that doesn't come, the apex board just has to assume the worst, that something bad has happened, that the circuit has died on the main computer, the payload has gone away, or something equally bad has happened. Um, and so at that point, it automatically fires the cutdown systems. There's also logic um, that I'm deviating from Loon's potential logic system because I don't remember what they implemented, but these are typical implementations here going ahead. You may want to not have this thing react when you're over a city, for example. So while it may lose communications with its main payload computer, it has a GPS, and you may have programmed a map of places 
to let's hold off for a minute <laughs> before doing this rapid cut down system. Um, that's called geofencing, uh, and you may that you may do that so that it doesn't ever land on land or just around population centers, uh, for example, are generally the two reasons you would do geofencing is to make sure it happens over water or not over specific land masses or to wait till you get to land masses if you want to recover the thing. Um, the other, um, where are the other ones? They're usually interesting. Yeah, so <laughs> there's also in terms of that system, the fail flying or the fail landing. Um, another country, the French, uh, their philosophy has been to not cut down, to uh, disengage the cut down system entirely when communication is lost, uh, with the logic being you don't want to fall down forcefully on anyone. And that is it's legit, because over time, you're typically going to sink slowly. Um, and not crash into the ground. Um, whereas the projects in the US typically follow the um, fail down philosophy of terminate once we've lost control. Uh, let's see what else do we have here? Yeah, no new questions. Um, to, to go back to the point of like, is it plausible that uh, a navigation failure could um, could result in an airspace incursion of another country. Um, that's absolutely plausible and it has happened many times in history, many, many times. Many times. <laughs> balloons are unreliable, balloons are hard. It's an environment up there where you can't go, you can't like put sensors on balloon film. It's really cold, you don't have a lot of mass and yeah, anyway, it's harder than rocket science, if you can believe that. So some famous examples of this, um, well, not famous. In the early 1960s, the US Weather Service was experimenting with uh, making small balloons fly around the world for months or years. Uh, and they would launch these from Boulder, Colorado uh, at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, in Boulder. By the way, they've got a great library and museum if you have a chance and are in Boulder. Uh, they're up on the beautiful, uh, right under the plateau there. And they launched a couple of them from there that were intended to land in the Atlantic Ocean because they didn't have permission to go to Europe. And they used a, uh, a mechanical clock mechanism where the pendulum was replaced with the balloon itself, the string because payloads always swing back and forth instead of a, if you think of a grandfather clock, which has a weight descending, pulling on, um, on a drum to keep, give the clock force uh, to tick. And the pendulum restrains the drum from moving except once per tick. If you invert that and you wrap the string of the balloon around this drum and couple it to a pendulum upside down, as the payload swings, it will cause the clock to tick, one tick forward every swing. And there's a typical predictable uh, oscillation period of a particular length string, which means once it has ticked a certain number of times, the string has unwound and will fall off the drum, and your payload will fall and your balloon will go up and pop. Well, it's cold up there. They didn't always work. And so there were several balloons that went over Europe, over Russia, over China, and back to the US, and around a few more times in the 1960s that were never publicized, uh, that no one knew about, there was no international response from. Uh, the National Weather Service contacted the State Department and uh, was told, if there's a problem, we'll deal with it. If there's no problem, just don't mention it. And um, so that was one of the earliest uh, ones where that I was aware of, though I know in the 1950s, we purposely sent balloons over Russia and Project Genetrix, uh, which was, it, it was the, what prompted the U2 program to 
be finished and accelerated because we we flew like a hundred balloons from Poland across Russia to the Pacific that contained uh, mapping cameras to just map Russia. Uh, they weren't steerable; they were just programmed to stay up there for a week and then land uh, with a buoyant capsule. And the Navy would come around in the Pacific and haul them out. The problem is balloons are hard uh, and sometimes unreliable, and so like half of the hundred landed in the Soviet Union and were recovered. Uh, and Khrushchev was not happy at all about this uh, and threatened the U.S. with bad things, you know, wars and whatnot. So, uh, so we stopped sending balloons over there. I think, I think his complaint was fair as our complaint about the Chinese balloon is fair. Um, and that's the balloons were halted and that's when the U-2 uh, came into play. Uh, let's see. Can you talk a bit about the challenges with the lightning electric static discharges? And Chris, I'm always trying to expand my mind. Uh, it helps when topic is relevant. I got to drink with some of the guys from the Red Bull launch out of Roswell. Nice. Uh, that's cool. Uh, that was a long time ago. Uh, they, uh, I knew... I think I know one of the consultants on that, uh, or at least Alan Eustace's flight. Um, anyway, we'll uh, come back to the Roswell launch in a minute. Um, can you talk a bit about the challenges with lightning slash static electric discharges? Yeah. Um, these balloons are generally uh, unshielded boxes of electronics just trying to keep themselves warm. Uh, you know, oftentimes just in molded styrofoam box with heaters inside their circuit boards, heaters on their batteries, and um, outside of these to save mass, the wires to the solar panels are just wires. As you saw on the solar panels themselves, uh, these are just wires hanging out here on the back of the panel. No shielding or anything because that's heavy and typically people don't expect to need shielding. Where's my... So... The problem is that flying over thunderstorms things are not a nice place. Uh, generally, balloon projects, the advice is don't do it. Don't go over storms. Keep a wide berth from storms. There's really few things that are made better by going over a thunderstorm. Um, the primary issue that is typically a concern is turbulence. Uh, Loon went over uh, some storms and uh, the accelerometers registered uh, complete overturning uh, rotations where payload went over the top of the balloon and then back down. Um, the violent uh, updrafts were so severe. Uh, and of course many of the balloons were lost due to this, uh, the payload puncturing the balloon. But some of the balloons were lost with no, no contact. They just went silent. And it took us, uh, you know, we really wanted to investigate this. So we, we took, um, we, we made some effort to go recover these payloads. And I don't remember the exact details of where they were, but I'm, I have to think they were over the, the tropics, uh, you know, somewhere in the equatorial zone where these thunderstorms are very common. Um, and Loon didn't really want to avoid the thunderstorms because they needed to provide cell service to their customers. So they needed to figure out how to survive being over a thunderstorm. And when they got a couple of these balloons back that had just gone dead, um, which they suspected had to do with the storms, uh, and had the whole system shipped back to Mountain View, where we were, uh, and investigated, they saw that uh, there was burn marks on all the circuit boards, like charred little spots where uh, clearly uh, high voltage arcs had jumped through various components in the circuit board and fried all the electronics. And that is uh, due to electrical discharges. Uh, lightning uh, is an effect that's not just the bolt you see on the ground. Uh, when lightning strikes, it is actually uh, the equalization of the voltage of not just the cloud, but the entire air all the way to space 
as a, as a charge that is different from the ground that's being equalized. And when this sudden spark occurs, all of the voltage and the power in that, or some of it, uh, suddenly has a region below it that no longer is the same charge. So it all jumps down or jumps up to equalize that charge. And that means uh, the things you might have heard of, of jets or sprites, uh, really picture, really pretty pictures of uh, electrical sprays and, and red, like jellyfish coming over uh, huge super uh, supercell thunderstorms. Um, that's caused by the, the voltage uh, potential, the gradient above the storm cloud. And that even if it's not big enough to actually see, if it's not powerful enough to see the spray uh, of the arcs and the static discharge, um, it's there, it happens. And uh, anything that's in its path um, has that current, that, that voltage differential is suddenly different from top to bottom of an object like the balloon. And it's far easier for this charge to go through metal than it is through open air. So it will take the shortcut through you to get to the bottom side of your balloon, for example. Uh, and the balloons are particularly badly situated or badly uh, vulnerable to this because you have a wire that runs from the apex, uh, the termination board, down to the bottom of the system where the main payload is. Uh, and so you have a fairly long span uh, to lure the uh, static uh, gradient to jump through you. Um, so that, uh, that was pretty neat to determine. And that meant we had to develop a solution, um, which was basically to go to uh, figuring out what we needed to shield, like how much weight should we sacrifice for protecting from these, these arcs and discharges. Um, versus how much could we skimp on? You know, do we need to put heavy woven shielding on that whole apex wire? Do we need to shield every single wire going out to every panel? Like, do we need to like make a total cage over the apex cut down safety mechanism? Uh, and there was a lot of calculations. We actually had developed a lightning uh, charge detector circuitry. I actually worked on one briefly. Um, to see what the differentials were, how close lightning strikes were getting. Um, and uh, actually also uh, just simply brought these to high voltage uh, facilities to test, uh, like Tesla coils, to see are our potential mitigation uh, effects, you know, our frames, our shields, our screens, are they enough to protect against a lightning strike or a high voltage corona uh, gradient going through them? And um, it turned out not to require much mass addition, um, and it was doable. And uh, then the balloon started surviving these uh, discharges high above the thunderstorms. So it was pretty neat. Some of my friends worked on that. I'm pretty proud of them for doing that. Got to wrap up here in a few minutes, but it's been really fun uh, talking to you all. Uh, great to have you all come in on the raid and uh, friends drop by as well. I know this has been impromptu, but I figured it would be fun to, to do a talk, uh, not widely advertised, just for the people that found it. Um, let's see what else we have here to wrap up. What are some of the new up and coming things being measured, observed via balloons? Hey, Phil, you're welcome. Um, there's you know climate measurements um the things being measured by balloons really aren't up and coming uh the uses for balloons really hasn't haven't changed in 60 70 years um there's communications there's measuring uh, you know air quality simple weather uh you know properties uh telescopes uh, you know all all ranges of telescope um frequencies like infrared optical uv x-ray um you know, doing measurements, mapping of things on the ground, observations of like multispectral uh, imaging applications like agriculture, forestry, etc. Um, you know, atmospheric quality measuring. Um, yeah, I mean, the applications of ballooning are not really different. Um, they're just rehashed into new protocols and new formats, uh, which is kind of funny. Balloons, 
Um, balloons can do amazing things if the balloons can just stay up there. Uh, the amazing things are ready and waiting. Uh, so it's kind of exciting right now. Now that uh, Google Loon has solved the problem of long duration flight, um, the applications are finally getting a chance. Um, well, probably good to end the stream with that car horn there. But uh, Chris, Phil, yeah, everybody, dingbats, Thanks for coming in. Sheila, good to see you. Uh, one last question from Dingbats. What, on the best picture of the Chinese balloon, there seems to be a line on the right side hanging down uh, from the top. Any idea what that is? Um, hold on. So yeah, let's bring that picture back up here. By the way, uh, do visit uh, my friend uh, Luis' uh, website, stratocat.com.ar, and Stratoballoon on Twitter. I'll put that in the chat here. Um, he has really the clearinghouse of all balloon news of NASA projects, of commercial projects, of strange interloper projects. Uh, stratocat.com slash AR. No. That is not caster shadowcat.com slash dot AR. Oh my god, this computer will not let me type stratocat. There you go. And uh, yeah, the, the string on the side, let's bring that back up here. I posted the link to their site in chat. Where's that window? Yeah, okay, the string on the side. Yeah, so that is a particularly obvious uh, feature here on the side. Um, that is too small to be an inflation duct, uh, which is used on zero pressure balloons um, as just a, a plastic film tube that goes up to the top for you to blow the helium in to the top of the balloon easily. Um, but it's, it's too narrow to be that. Uh, and plus super pressure balloons, um, it's probably too narrow to be that. Um, super pressure balloons have to have a very good seal on their inflation port and um, it would be very difficult to inflate through a tube um, and have the seal close uh, afterwards. It, it's possible, I suppose. And at this range, it's possible that may be a duct and not just a string, but um, I would imagine more likely it is a string to retain the apex down during inflation uh, so that you can inflate it while the balloon is held down let me bring you up, bring you a picture uh, of this process that we used in early Loon so you can see what I'm talking about. I'm glad I took a lot of pictures at Loon. It's, uh, it's really nice to have the memories and be able to finally uh, share them. I need to organize them a little better though. There we go. Yeah, these two, these two are it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I don't have the videos, but uh, mm -mm. okay. There's the picture window. Okay, so the string is quite possibly this. So you see here. Um, <laughs> This person, sorry I didn't blur your face there, I can't remember your name. Um, this person is holding down the apex, the top of a loon balloon here. And uh, you can see some of the features as discussed. Let me zoom in here. This is the apex plate. Uh, and you can actually see the window here. This, uh, this clear area here is that window that the arm slices around, uh, the half section of the plate. Uh, you can see uh, a drogue parachute here and the actual balloon, the actual system descent parachute there. 
and this is the the pipe that brings the helium in to the balloon and uh, these are some sensors that go into the balloon there as well so you will notice here that there is a string there's a string restraining this apex and you can see that the helium bubble is fairly big there's nothing in here except helium so it's uh, it's lifting you can see he is he's holding it uh, he's just holding it from moving uh, the string is very tight it's holding you know probably 100 pounds of tension at this point because it's not lifting the rest of the balloon it's not lifting the payload um, so it's got to be dealt with and here is what it looks like from the other side so you can see uh, it's a lot of helium. You can see these uh, these weights are what's holding it down. This is a foam clamp that's restraining it. And uh, if you see uh, this in the back through the balloon is the apex plate we just looked at. So the hold down is this this thing here and the string at the other end. So to launch the balloon, you have to let the top go and stand back up. Let me uh, I'll give you a little video here. How can I do that? Actually, I don't think I can do a video, but I can show you a picture of this, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, what the heck? I can give you a video of a loon balloon taking off. Open before I go here. Where's that? Open. So it is not the part where they let the bubble stand up, but uh, you'll see it's right after that. Let me switch windows here. There we go. Okay, so uh, what you see here is uh, what we were just looking at, um, you see the orange clamp uh, and the same guy at the left, extreme left hand side of the screen. And what they have done from back there, uh, that red string we saw just a little bit ago has been, they have let that out to slowly allow that big bubble to stand up in the air. And you can and that string makes things a little complicated because if you tie it up there uh, it's going to fly with the balloon and that mass is going to be added um, but if you want to get rid of that mass of the string you have to find a way to release it and the way we did it in loon was not great it just went through a ring on that plate that we saw in the previous picture uh, and both sides of it came back down and when the balloon was up we would just release one end of that string and pull the other and it would go zipping up through the hole and fly back down. But the end of that string can can slap into the plastic and damage it on the way down. So if you're going to do it that way, ideally, you would let the string fly with the balloon. And that is possibly why we see a string hanging from the side of the Chinese balloon was an artifact of launching, of letting the balloon stand up right before liftoff. And here, we'll get to see liftoff. There you go. I'll rerun that uh, one more time. See the orange clamp gets released. This very small payload gets put under the balloon before release. Uh, little radar reflectors dangle below and it goes away. Uh, one twentieth of the volume uh, and as it climbs it expands until it forms that full pumpkin shape. All right, everybody, uh, thanks so much for joining. Uh, subscribe, follow, um, you know, follow my Twitch, uh, my Twitter, I'll throw up my Twitter. Uh, go see stratocat.ar, they're the best. Um, let's see, I've already got a Twitter overlay here. Nah. Let's see that. Balloon Sidan. There you go. And 
that is me on Twitter and Twitch as well. Uh, YouTube, I can't remember the link. It's a bunch of random letters. So, well, thank you all. Take care. Glad to have you all for some balloon science chat. And I'll see you later.